And we're back, um, CNT 140, we're back talking a little bit more about history. Again, we're trying to get some of the principles of light and um, how light is handled to understand how fiber optics work. So we're continuing on. We just got done doing the uh, Tyndall experiment. So now we're looking at late 1800s, Alexander Graham Bell. Most of us recognize him from work on the telephone. Shortly after he had the telephone kind of up and working, he started experimenting with using light to send voice. Again, we have lots of inventors and scientists looking to harness light in some manner. And here's Bell saying, hey, you know, I can send voice across a wire. I wonder if I can send voice using light. So he developed something called the photofoam, where here's kind of a rough schematic. Um, he took light and reflected it using a little mirror. Um, think of this almost as, if, if you think of the very thin uh, reflective wrapper that's on a Pop-Tart, you know, you take the Pop-Tart out in that very thin reflective wrapper, that Mylar wrapper. Um, if you take that and kind of stretch that into a mirror shape and talk at it, as you're talking at that, your sound waves are vibrating that, and that vibration is kind of being aimed at a cell on the other end, a photograph, a photo cell on the other end, and as the light is varying, hitting that photo cell on the other end, the voltage coming out of it's going to vary. So the idea of trying to harness uh, voice using light, that's what he created, called the photophone, and this did work. Um, here's you know the Wikipedia page about it, all that jazz. But here's what it looked like, where you're having the speaking trumpet here, you know, harnessing light, and it's sending it across the room to a receiver on the other end. Again, different people trying to harness light for reasons. 1880s, William Wheeler um, used a system of light pipes to uh, illuminate a home. Now, we're talking 1880s. We're talking people are using candles, people are using oil lamps, that sort of thing. Um, we now have somebody using an electric arc lamp. An electric arc lamp is kind of like two welding rods coming together, making a super bright white light. Um, these often... Uh, I don't think they're used so much in uh, stage productions anymore, but these were very common with uh, spotlights for stage productions because they would produce a very, very brilliant white light. Um, imagine putting one of those in the basement of your house and then from that using light pipes to light all the interior rooms of your house. So you don't have candles or lanterns on the walls of every room in your house. You have a light pipe coming from this electric arc lamp in your basement to every room in the house. Uh, interesting idea. And it works on this principle. Um, if if you have a skylight in your house today, you're bringing light in through that window. But if you have an interior room in your house, you can actually use what they call them a solar tube. On the roof of your house, you put a little lens up here, and the uh, you connect it to your interior light or interior room using a tube that kind of reminds you of almost like a dryer hose. Very flexible, but the inside is all reflective. And you're basically piping the light from outside of your house into an interior room, and it lights that room just using sunlight. And believe it or not, it works on moonlight, too. you got a full moon night, uh, an interior room in the house, one of these actually looks like there's a light on. It's pretty cool. Uh, so 1880s, you have Wheeler working on this using light pipes to bring light into an interior room or rooms of a house. Um, and that phenomenon is used today with uh, solar lights, if you will. 1888, you have a uh, medical team looking at using bent glass rods to illuminate body cavities. Again, this might sound a little weird, but um, 1880s, if you're working on somebody for surgery or working on researching uh, why somebody died, doing an uh, autopsy after the fact, it's kind of hard to get candles or oil lamps down into a body cavity, down into, you know, chest cavity or stomach or that sort of thing. So they were experimenting using uh, bent glass rods to illuminate the, these cavities. Again, kind of harnessing light. Um, 1895, you have a French engineer using bent glass rods for guiding light images in an early attempt at television. Uh, think of this this way. If you can imagine every pixel on your screen, think of an older TV where it was much more pixelated than it is today. Think of every pixel on the screen almost as a little piece of fiber optic. Well, if you think of it that way, I could have my camera that has, you know, thousands of fiber optics aimed at the picture. Those fiber optic lines connect over to a screen where, again, every piece of fiber optic is a pixel on the screen. That was his idea of trying to send television images or images as an early form of television. Again, there is no such thing as television yet, but this is experimenting with transmitting images using fiber optic, if you will. Um, kind of cool when you think about it.
1898, uh, David Smith applied for a patent, bent glass rods to uh, basically a surgical lamp. Again, trying to get light into a mouth or down into somebody's chest cavity if you're doing uh, uh, surgery, that sort of thing, using early fiber optic to light an interior space. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, 1920s, you have um, Englishman Baird and Hansel patent the idea of using a razor transparent rods to transmit images for television. Again, experimenting with uh, one piece of fiber optic for every pixel, if you will, early form of television. People keep trying to harness this, harness fiber optics. Uh, har har I should say harness transmitting uh, data with light. 1930s, we have LOM here. Uh, looking, again, inaccessible body part, uh, tubes to light an internal body cavity for surgery. 1950s, we have another physicist looking at um, experiments with light and transferring, transferring data with light, if you will. He's often considered the father of fiber optics, because now we're getting a little bit closer to what we think of fiber optics today. 1954, we have some other scientists. Uh, these two worked on papers talking about imaging bundles, but talked about unclad and clad fibers. Well, unclad is just that, a plastic rod that has no insulation or shielding around it. Well, as you send light through that, some of it's going to bleed out. Meanwhile, a clad fiber is, think of that same plastic tube where I put insulation around it. Well, the insulation around it is going to try to keep some of the light in the fiber. So he comes up with the idea of, hey, cladding... I will have less light loss. I have less signal loss because I'm cladding my fiber. Again, this was not known stuff at the time. We have people figuring it out and putting it down, saying this works better. So I'm going to come back in our next podcast and show you the idea of uh, cladded fiber and uncladded fiber and what happens.